everyone has to do better. Like we need even non-Black doctors to be able to care for Black patients. Like it, it cannot be left up to us. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With The Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Journey Podcast. I'm really excited today because I'm joined by my good friend, Dr. Uche Blackstock. Dr. Uche is incredible. She has lived many lives. She is a doctor doctor of the doctors um, and comes from a long legacy of doctors as well. We'll get into her story today, but really the reason why I wanted her to come on the podcast is because a lot of times in the journey, we talk about how we've gotten to where we are today. We've talked about being ambitious and wanting to defy the odds, wanting to build generational wealth, wanting to live a more balanced life, wanting to enjoy life every single day and not necessarily be on this rat race. Sometimes it can feel like we are running an uphill mountain, not even a hill, like a mountain. We're running up a mountain. And it's because of a variety of factors. But one of the key factors, particularly if you're a woman, particularly if you're a Black person in this country, is because of how the world has been set up and how the science and biology is working. And Dr. Uche is going to talk to us about um, the social determinants of health today. So I really encourage you to, to listen to this episode, if only to give yourself a little bit of grace, if only so yes. that you can understand yourself, your family, your cousins, and your peers, and to have a little bit more empathy for why things may feel hard sometimes. I've got girlfriends in my family where I'm just like, why is your whole family always sick? <laughs> like, it just feels like you've been dealt a bad hand. And I'm just not sure that other non-Black folks deal with this. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about actually the story, the science, the history of how we got here. So welcome, Dr. Uche, to the Journey Podcast. Thank you so much, Morgan. I'm so excited to be here talking to you today. Tell us a little bit about your background. Tell me a little bit about um, your mother and how you kind of became a doctor. What made you decide to go into the medical field? Well, I always say that you know, growing up, I thought that most physicians were Black women <laughs> because my mother was a doctor. My pediatrician was a Black woman. Every every doctor that I saw, because my mother also led a group of local Black women physicians, you know, mm -hmm. doing service in our community. So I thought for the longest time, probably until I was a teenager, that most doctors look like me. <laughs> so I, until I, I realized like what the, the facts were, I was, you know, in my own la la land, essentially. And I didn't realize that we really are, you know, Black women are less than 3% of all physicians. But really, my mother was my role model. You know, she grew up about 15 minutes from where I live right now in Brooklyn. Very different set of beginnings. You know, was born to a single mom. She had five other siblings. They grew up in public assistance. Um, she had a, she had a very rough life. Was always moving, always changing schools. Uh, but was very, very determined. Um, I think she had a lot of potential curiosity, um, and she ended up being the first person in her family to go to college. She attended Brooklyn wow. College. And then had a chemistry professor there, a Black man, who was like, mm -hmm. I think that you should consider applying to medical school. And she was like, you think so? Wow. And she ended up applying and got into all of her medical schools and ended up at Harvard Med. Harvard. She I know. And I, Harvard. Right. <laughs> and there she felt like a fish out of water. She was like, what am I doing here? Like, Oh, my God. There, I can't even imagine. Yeah. There was a relative of Jackie Onassis. You know, some, some of the kids, one of their parents won the Nobel Prize. She was right. like, what am, what am I doing here? But she found her people there because her yeah. class was one of the first classes that they really were putting forward diversity initiatives. They had other Black right. folks there. Incredible. And then you went to Harvard and your sister went to Harvard. Yes, we did. And we're the first Black mother-daughter legacy from Harvard Med School. I say that with pride. I say that also with yeah. frustration because, you know, when we always talk about the first, you know, we just want to yeah. celebrate. But we also need to acknowledge, you know, all of the, the, the racism and, and barriers that have prevented more of us from, yeah. you know, being there as well, right? Like that right. is, you know, like this whole idea of exceptionalism. I always like want to make sure that I address that because mm -hmm. there are a lot of exceptional people that grew up with my mom. There are a lot of exceptional mm -hmm. people that grew up with me. 
But mm-hmm. because of these barriers that we face, like lack of generational wealth, right? Lack of access to, to resources and opportunities, we don't end up where we deserve to be. That's right. Let's go into a little bit about your upcoming book that's releasing um, January 23rd, which is the week this podcast is coming out. Yes. So for those who are listening, you will be forced to buy this book because I <laughs> really, really want you to hear the long story. But Dr. Uche, tell us about why you decided to write this book and what were some of your findings as you were right. embarking on this journey. So it's called Light to a Black Physician Reckons with Racism in Medicine. And it's really just acknowledging this experience that, you know, I am a Black woman. I'm a, I'm a mother of two little Black boys, but I'm also a Black physician. So I have all these lived experience. I'm like inside the system, outside the system, second generation. And so I thought it was really important for me to use my own story, my mother's story as kind of a vehicle to talk about these larger issues that impact the health of our communities. And so the mm-hmm. book goes from childhood to when I'm in medical school, to when I'm in training, to even all of some of the issues that I face as you know, as a faculty at an academic medical center, as a Black woman, which actually prompted me because I was feeling muzzled and silenced in a workplace that was sexist and racist. Yeah, I had to peace out. And that's how I started my own consulting firm. And here I am five years later after starting that consulting firm being like, still pinch me. Like I left this career that I thought was going to be my entire life, started my own company. I'm not even an entrepreneur. I'm I'm, (laughs) I'm a... Well, I am. I am. But you are I'm now. A, I, I am right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, but I'm, but I'm now an entrepreneur. That's my identity. So just kind of it's realizing my own my own power and the experiences that I had, but also yeah. recognizing how a lot of the healthcare institutions, they create environments that are inhospitable to us professionally, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. also that trickles down to the care that our patients receive. So mm-hmm. I wanted to use this book to talk about some of the, the history, like a lot of history that some of us know and some of us don't know about, mm-hmm. you know, for example, there was a, the Flexner report. It was a report in 1910 that led to the closure of five out of seven of the historically Black medical schools in this mm-hmm. country. And what that did, a study came out a few years ago, it would have educated between 25,000 and 35,000 Black physicians. Or doctors. So, right. So when, when we look around and say, oh, wait, why aren't there more of us? There are reasons why. So we look at, like, for example, the SCOTUS decision on Mm race-conscious admissions from a few months ago, and we think about what is the impact going to be on our communities? What is the impact going to be on Black health? There is going to be an impact. So I want to make sure people understand, they're able to connect the dots that, no, there are very few of us, not because there's anything wrong with us. There Mm. is something wrong historically and contemporarily with this country. Mm-hmm. You know, I live in Nashville where Meharry Medical School yes. is, and my father is a physician. He went to Howard undergrad in Stanford Medical School and is a pediatrician for hematology, oncology, sickle cell disease, primarily yes. at this stage yes. of his career. And my brother is a doctor. He also went to Stanford Medical School and is a ortho trauma surgeon at Duke. I am the rogue entrepreneur in the family. <laughs> And I watched my father fight constantly for equitable care for Black children with sickle cell disease in this country. And you would not believe the stories and the lack of just standardized understanding and care for a disease that primarily impacts people of African descent. Yes, yes. I I write about it in the book. Like one of the patients I write about in my book is this patient Jordan with sickle cell disease, mm-hmm. who literally, he's, he's really a composite of a lot of patients I took care of because here in Brooklyn, where I trained, we also have a lot of patients with sickle cell disease. Mm-hmm. And, and I talk about the fact in the book, the fact is, is that there are people from the Mediterranean, people from India who yeah. have sickle cell disease, mm-hmm. but because so many people in this country who have sickle disease are black, it's been racialized as a black disease. And because mm-hmm. of that, as you know, There has been a lack of funding towards research, towards finding cures for it. And people with sickle cell disease are stigmatized, right? As as, uh, drug seekers seeking pain medication, you can't trust them. So I wrote about all of that in this Mm -hmm. book. Yeah. And I think one of my experiences growing up, I spent a lot of time with the kids. I was a kid, you know, so I spent a lot of time with my dad's patients every summer. And it wasn't just that they were in constant pain. I mean, the pain, the chronic pain 
is serious when you have sickle cell disease. But it was also just the standard understanding across the education system. And, you know, these kids had to have blood transfusions more often and their children. So that means their parents have to accompany them, which means their parents have to take off work. And if your clinic is only open on weekdays, not on the weekends, then your parents are missing work right, a lot right. you know, to accompany your kids to the hospital to get these blood transfusions. And so parents were winding up without jobs, right? Or some of these yeah. kids were having um, silent strokes and they weren't being diagnosed by their doctors. And so they were having behavioral issues in class. So they were written off as problem children. They were in the kind of classrooms for problem children and segmented out. In reality, they'd had a silent stroke. And so this was actually a representation of indicator of of something happening in their health that needed to be managed, not because they were incapable of sitting in a classroom. These are the kind of things, y'all, if you're listening to this, you're just like, oh my God, this is the kind of stuff. This is just one little, 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 little example in an entire series of examples that Dr. Uche talks about where the world is not set up to manage and accommodate and help put us on the right trajectory. So tell us some more about other implications or things that you saw and talk about in your book. Yeah, I mean, you know, even just, um, you know, that point that you make about the children who who suffered a silent stroke, but instead of saying, okay, maybe these children have something underlying going on, they were like stigmatized or they they were labeled as like, you know, difficult kids or challenging Mm -hmm. kids. And And that often happens with Black patients when we go to seek care Often, you know, our concerns are minimized, ignored, mm-hmm. or dismissed, which yeah. leads us to really, you're, you are missing a diagnosis. You're missing an important diagnosis that can actually be life-threatening. So, mm-hmm. you know, so I talk about in the book, especially, you know, Black people who are, you know, are birthing people who are, you know, who are pregnant, mm-hmm. we see that many of them will say, when I go to the hospital and I'm saying I'm having certain symptoms, I'm not being listened to. And so we think, you know, from the data that that's one of the reasons why we have such a high Black maternal mortality rate in this country. We have higher than any other high income nation. We actually have higher than even some mid income nations. Right. And this is, again, despite advances in innovation and technology, but it's because essentially health professionals are not listening to us. And so what they're doing by not listening to us, they are missing potentially deadly diagnoses. And we know that this can happen with Serena Williams, who is like, yep. who's the goat. If it can happen to Allison Felix, right? Yeah. If it can happen to these women who know their bodies so well and have the resources, then we know it can happen to the average Black woman. Right. And what actually the data shows, <laughs> and you know, I, I recently gave birth a few months ago. I have a-, I know. a Congratulations. Baby. Thank you. He's so cute. He's probably crying somewhere in the house. But one of the things that I was working a lot during my pregnancy, you know, I did yeah. an acquisition during my pregnancy. We had just so much going on at Blavity. And there was a point where I went to the hospital because I was having um, preterm contractions. And mm-hmm. I thought that they were just Braxton Hicks. But then I started counting them and said, mm-hmm this is a little too consistent, a little too often. And I was really early, like maybe seven months. Right. And so I went to the ER and, you know, that's just a very scary experience. And turns out everything was fine. I think that I just had high blood pressure and because my girlfriends were in town, we were doing my nesting party and I was just excited. Right. right. Um, But it was a wake up call that, oh my God, if something Mm -hmm. had been wrong, this could have been really challenging for my child and for me. And at that point, my father, who had done a really good job just being my dad and not Dr. Dad, yeah. uh, sent me a bunch of research and said, look, regardless of how wealthy you are, regardless of how good you eat, regardless of how many resources and how much help you have, the data shows that you are more likely to give preterm birth and to have preeclampsia regardless of resources, Morgan, regardless of education. And he sent me the research and it is so clear. It's literally, they have have done the studies to show if you are black and you're a woman, it doesn't matter how rich you are. (laughs) Right. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Right. It doesn't matter like what your profession is. It doesn't like, like that is, that is not protective at all. And that's why I always talk about like, that is how embedded racism is in our society and that's how how pervasive and dangerous it is like it literally right. is killing us and our socioeconomic status cannot protect us so if, when you think about it you know 
you have the best access to healthcare, you know, quality Perfect. services, all, all of that, right? And so it's like, well, so then why? So why is it still happening, right? So, so that's why, why is it still happening? Like, t- like right. walk me through it. Because yeah. To me, it's very frustrating as someone who's like, I try to eat all the best things. I have I nutrition coaches. I right. do all the things. I live five minutes from the hospital. My dad's a freaking doctor. Yes. I shouldn't have to worry about these things. Yeah. And the fact is, is that, you know, for us and even being a professional, dealing with everyday racism, it stress. wears us down. That chronic mm-hmm. stress, it causes our cortisol levels, like that stress hormone level to stay high. So that, that cortisol mm-hmm. level should not always be high. It can be high mm-hmm. in certain certain circumstances, but for us, it is always high. And that stresses your heart, right? That stresses your other vital organs, right? Mm-hmm. And so then, the, so this idea that uh, it's called weathering. So this um, public health researcher named Arlene Geronimus, she developed this term a few decades ago called weathering, and found that in Black people and people of color, everyday racism causes essentially a wear and tear on our bodies. So it actually results in premature aging. And it's Mm. almost, although we know race is a social construct, when you look at the ends of our DNA, it's called telomeres. Mm -hmm. Our telomeres are shorter than white people's because of that stress, of that wear and tear. The other thing I want to, I know, I know. The other thing I want to mention is this this field called epigenetics. It's not new, but it's Mm. this idea that when you think about infant mortality or white black babies are much smaller or even maternal mortality, some mm-hmm. some thought and research is that it is the stress that black enslaved you know, women went through mm-hmm. centuries ago that actually is showing up now. Like that stress actually changes how genes are expressed. Mm-hmm. So when, because you know, when a, a woman is pregnant with a, a baby that's female by birth, that baby also has has eggs, eggs, has eggs in it. Mm-hmm. So those eggs are influenced by generations. I know, I know, I know, I know. So, that, so that's why people are like, oh, but you know, we had a black president, but oh, we have black people in powerful positions. No, but if that doesn't holistically and materially change how healthy our environments are and how, right. you know, the, str- the stress that we go through, it's not going to change anything. We're still going to have bad outcomes. And what I think is interesting is that, not interesting, it's horrible. Like we're actually seeing worse health outcomes for Black people. Like outcomes, our, our yeah. Life expectancy, life expectancy actually for all Americans has dropped with the pandemic. In high income countries, it's actually rebounded of our peer nations. But in the US, it continues to go down. And of course, Black people, Indigenous people, you know, we, we keep sl- it's sliding back. So I think this is the most insane thing to me that like, our generation and our children are going to have a harder time than our parents did. Like your mother and my father were of the same peer group. Yes. Had an easier life (laughs) than us to some extent, despite the fact that they were first in many, 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 many more categories than us. Yes. And that our sons, I mean, I think about our sons and I'm like, so my kid's not going to be a legacy at WashU. My kid's not going to be a legacy Mm -hmm. at Stanford and Harvard. What the hell? We work so hard for this. I, thank you. I know. Yeah. Your your sons aren't going to be legacies I, at Harvard Medical. What? Well, I guess they'll be legacy, but they won't get any brownie points. Right. 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 So, 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 what are your thoughts on the current situation? I mean, like, what? How do like, you like, like like with all the anti DI initiatives? Yeah, like, like Elon yeah. Musk. You no, know, yeah, it's fucking mm-hmm. remote. Things should be merit based and not DNI based. Yeah. Or Lululemon CEO talking about I, how I'm like, this is crazy. I have four hundred dollars worth of Lululemon mm-hmm. in two pieces of freaking of your products. I'm just gonna right. kind of throw it away. Like I know. How yeah, do you process it, this? I know. I mean, we have to we have to fight this. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, with if it's legal workarounds, we really we can't back down. But we know this is a backlash, right? This is a backlash to progress. It's oh, always know. right. This always happens. But when I think about it for our communities, I think it's like life or death. Because if you don't have us in these positions of leadership, if you don't have us as health professionals, right? If you don't have us in various aspects of society, if you don't have us doing research on Black people and improving our health outcomes. I mean, if you don't have us mentoring younger Black folks, literally, it's like a domino effect. Like the repercussions. It's not like these white people are going to say, well, let me research sickle cell disease. Like they don't care. Like like you need us. Like you you need us. I'm not saying that as Black health professionals that we are completely perfect. Because sometimes, you know, we are educated sometimes in those same predominantly white environments. And sometimes we can 
internalize some of that, right? You know, I, I've had Black patients tell me that they've been disrespected by Black health professionals. And I'm like, okay, you know, let, listen, okay. listen, yes, that, that can happen, right? And we all can do better, but we everyone has to do better. Like we need even non-Black doctors to be able to care for Black patients. Like it, it cannot be left up to us. And so- right. That's why, like, it's about what happens within medical schools and medical training and to make sure that we have, like, you know, anti-racist curriculum. But obviously yes. now there's that push against this. So we are going to be, like, up against the wall again. Well, it's really challenging because um, the way the Republicans are doing it is very, very smart. They are taking things out of textbooks. They're taking things out of policies, right? When Trump was in office, they took things out of the government for what can be funded, right? Things like the NIH are government funded, National Institute of Health, right? right? So if you start to try to push against those structures that are set up to finance the work of finance schooling, you know, they were trying to take funding away from HBCUs. You're taking things away from the funding of the institutions and we have not built up enough of a black philanthropy base to manage the privatization of these institutions right. and finance the endowments. I mean, I think Morehouse and Spelman and Howard, of course, have great endowments, but that's just like a very small, small portion right. of the entire education system for our communities. So one of the things that's challenging for me as someone who has a platform, has a voice, has huge, huge audience is I don't even know who to yell at because it feels like yelling at people doesn't actually matter because we've got a former president getting away with literally fraud and so much crazy stuff and you're going to get elected. So yeah. how do we how do we start to tackle this from your perspective, particularly as it relates to health disparities? Yeah. You know, I want people to understand that a lot of what makes people healthy is what happens at a neighborhood, like a local level. So while it seems like all this stuff, you know, it seems like what's happening at a federal level is so overwhelming and a state level is so depressing, I want people to think about what's happening in their communities. What are community-based organizations that you can get involved with, that you can support around food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, you know, doula organizations. For example, in Minneapolis, there is a Black-owned birthing center called the Roots Mm -hmm. Birthing Center, and Mm -hmm. its goal is to focus on you know, improving preterm deliveries, right? Decreasing maternal health outcomes. And they've been doing really well. We need to like be funding those kind of programs and and, and community-based programs. You know, like I think sometimes thinking, yes, what's happening, yeah, on a federal level, state level is is very upsetting, but we need to look around with what's happening in our areas and how can we make a difference locally within our Mm -hmm. neighborhoods? Because again, like I said, that's what determines like where people live, where they work, where they pray, where they love. That mm-hmm. is, that's really what makes them healthy. Mm, okay. So in other words, if we really want to help the people around us, yes, care and call and do all the things at the top, but yes. truly it's the day to day is really what's impacting Absolutely. our health the most. Absolutely. It's the Absolutely. interactions, it's the how is yeah. the hospitals that we go to actually right. interact? It's like, it's like, do people have safe, affordable housing? Um, are they able to right. find a job with benefits and, you know, and medical leave and insurance? Like literally like the basics that can happen on a local level that you can advocate for. Right. Because because a lot of what's happening, mm-hmm. a lot of the good stuff that's happening, it's happening at a local level, even around reparations, it's happening on local, like, yeah. like in Evanston or in mm-hmm. parts of California, you know? So I think that, you know, it, it seems super overwhelming, the problem, but if I think we, if we start locally, because we know that's where the biggest impact is, that we can make a difference. Yeah, I hear you. I still am just like, I know, I know. If our institutions that, it's kind of like the Booker T. Washington of it all. Like, you know, if our institutions aren't set up, then the dividends that someone like you going to in Harvard, right? It's not just you. It's everyone that you influence being in that classroom. Everyone that all the professors that you and it's it's everything. So I yes, know. I agree. We should care at the local level and contribute at the local level. But I still feel like we have to fight and be loud. No, I, I agree. And I, I think a lot of the work like the, that my consulting firm does, like we work with 
healthcare organizations and institutions and academic medical mm-hmm. centers who actually want to do the work. And somehow mm-hmm. they're able to, you know, whether it's how we word stuff or whatever, we are still right. able to get these grants and proposals and do the work. Right. And that is like what is reassuring to me that there are still people out there, organizations out there that want to do this hard, deep work for the long mm-hmm. term. But, you know, we're going to find ways to get the work done. That's right. And what are your thoughts just on how the social determinants of health impact the wealth gap and how Black folks are showing up in the workplace? Because there's a lot of conversation. I don't know if you follow Lisa Beasley. She's corporate Erin. She's the Black woman. Oh, yes. On social media. Yes. 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 Um, Lisa is actually a former WorkSmart advisee, so I know her very well. And I'm so happy for her success. She's so funny. She doesn't even break character when I DM her. I'm like, girl, I know you. (laughs) But one of the things that I think people find really triggering about corporate Erin, particularly Black folks and women of color, is we're just like, oh my God, this is our experience, right? It's like the corporate speech. It's the microaggressions, it's the gaslighting, it's the diminishing of like, there is something wrong. Or my boss is saying something that I think is inappropriate. And it's the, this, the corporatizing of right. our true feeling. And it just feels like everyone is tired of working. <laughs> like everyone is tired of being in a corporate environment. And it's funny, I say this as a boss who has people who are probably tired of being in my own corporate environment, no matter how hard I try to work to make it a great yeah. place to work. What are your thoughts on how we as people of color should be trying to balance the fact that we have to work for a living? Like we are in a capitalistic society. It's not like we can all just say we're just not going to work so that we manage our stress. Like how do we balance this? I know. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I struggle with that a lot. And when I started my consulting firm, you know, it was just me. And then it's grown, right? And what I didn't recognize is that, oh, I was creating this, the environment that I needed and that I always Mm -hmm. wanted for the people who are working for me, right? Mm -hmm. So I just think when we're in these leadership roles, like we want to make sure that the folks who work for us are able to show up authentically, right? As Mm -hmm. their true selves, that we're seeing them, that we value them and that we appreciate them because we know how it feels like not to mm-hmm. even, I, listen, I, people are like, wait, you go into Harvard undergrad, Harvard medical school, and you were at a point in your career where you felt like you were average and that you, you forgot you were someone with gifts to share to the world. I know, I know. So I'm not telling, I'm not saying everyone should leave and become an entrepreneur. Cause I know that that's not the case, right? <laughs> yeah, more like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone doesn't have that, but I do think that we have to find ways to hold leadership accountable to creating these environments for black yeah. people, especially for black women. Like it is yeah. just, it's so critical because we end up in these environments where we're silenced, we're muzzled. Like when I look at pictures of myself from when I was in academia, you know, you can look at a picture, an old picture of yourself and, and know where you were mentally Which at that time. Yeah. yeah, I had bags under my eyes. I had lost yeah. so much weight and I just thought I don't look happy. Yeah. And I think and the same so, thing about pictures when I look back at when I was working, my face was so inflamed like basically a whole nother inch on my face because just the stress. Right. And when we remove ourselves from those environments, it's almost like, it's like a life or death. It's like, we've actually made ourselves healthier. Like that was a, mm-hmm. a, li- a life-saving decision, but it's, mm-hmm. but it's true. Like the challenge is how do we make sure that these environments are created for us, right? In corporate mm-hmm. America, how do we hold leadership accountable to making sure that they do that? And that's a challenge. It's so yeah. when d and programs are systemically getting defunded at these corporations. I know. And, and roles are getting slashed. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. The chief diversity officer, it's interesting because of my work with Afrotech, I meet a lot of chief diversity officers and there are, I'd say about 50% of the ones that I meet actually have no power. They have no budget. They have no power. They're just right. figureheads. Yes. Now they're paid a shit ton of money as individuals. So they're kind of like happy okay. and they're kind of not trying to rock the boat, frankly. And then there's the other half that are the CEOs and the boards have really made this commitment to diverse and inclusion and not just diversity for black folks, but literally like yeah. inclusion as a yeah. part of their company values and being a progressive company in that way. More recently, as I've talked to some of those who have the power about how the current climate is impacting them, mm-hmm. one of the things that they say, and it's so interesting, and I, I haven't had enough time to unpack it, so I'm curious what you'll say, but one of the things that's come up is that white male managers and white male people leaders have been complaining because they have a really hard time managing women and people of color because they're too scared. They're mm-hmm. scared to give feedback. They're scared to give uh, constructive advice. They're scared to actually help that person advance because they don't want to be labeled as racist or sexist. And there's actually a research study that shows that when women and people of color get feedback, it's really generic. 
it's like right. it's not it's not like specific it's not constructive right because 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 they're scared because they're scared these men get- are scared and so it's this whole I'm talking to these leaders about like how do you how do you fix this because this is also why more black people and women don't advance as quickly right. because they're not getting the, Given the feedback and constructive, constructive feedback I know I so they plateau I, yeah my consulting firm we work with leaders in healthcare around these issues like how do you communicate effectively and inclusively with your staff around these issues, because we know like there is this fear in terms of giving, giving feedback, but in doing so you prevent your staff from moving forward in their careers. So, I mean, I think that we have to be really intentional about kind of like the skills development that leaders have, that managers have, right? Right. Like we have to actually work with them around like what kind of language to use, how not to feel like that fear, because you actually are undermining, you end up undermining the people that you're supervising. And you're unintentionally doing it. I think a lot of people have good intentions. They're trying to be the good guy and they're trying not to step on someone's toes and they're trying not to offend. But the result is then that person feels like, why am I not advancing? Why am I not getting the promotion? Why am I not getting the raise? And the answer may be you have a skills gap, but nobody's helping you, which is also not okay, not fair. And that adds to the stress of the gaslighting of it all. And it's just this never ending cycle. I'm so excited for your work to be more mainstream. Thank you. (laughs) The more that we can talk about these things, the more that each one of us can make a choice at the individual level, wherever we have our power to try to make a difference. Yeah, I always talk about these equity choice points that we have both in our personal and professional lives where you can make a choice and it can be the status quo or you can make a choice and it could be through the lens of equity. And so Mm -hmm. you have to take that leap to make that Mm -hmm. equitable choice point. And we should always be thinking about that. Yeah, one of the commitments that I'm going to make right here on the podcast is... I'm not back from maternity leave yet, but having gone through this experience, I need to change our maternity leave policy. You know, we have mm. parental leave, but I, I think as a birthing person, there is a little bit more that we should be doing at the company level. And as a startup, you know, you, you can't afford for, if you've only got 20 people, you can't afford right. for everybody to have a year off <laughs> maternity leave, especially if your company's mostly right. women, you can wind up with th- two people working and then those two people quit because they're tired. So there's all these things that I've had to balance, but now we are at the scale and I think I'm at the power That's level awesome. where I can say, you know what, we can just afford to do this a little bit better, even if yeah. it's an outsized benefit package for a company of our size. Mm-hmm. I can do what I want. I'm the boss. So right. it's just got to build it into the plan. And I'm going to take this my own challenge and say, okay, how can we make this experience easier for the women in our company um, and the birthing people in our company who... Yeah are going on this journey because there are just so many risks (laughs) along the way. And even for that child that's coming into the world, their ability to be fully developed and fully attached is partially dependent on their, their parents availability. So absolutely. That is one thing I will change. So for those of you all who are listening in, make a commitment. What is one thing that you have the power to change that could help someone else around you, whether that's making sure that you're donating on a regular basis financially or time and services. If you have a skill set, are there organizations that you can go and be helpful to people of color and help them advance or help reduce someone else's stress level, do something to make someone's life easier, healthier, and let us know in the comments and the DMs what you're going to commit to, because I would love to see, and I'm sure Dr. Uche would love to see as well. Absolutely. All right. So where can everyone find your book and yeah. how else can people connect with you? So they can find Legacy of Black Physician Reckons with Racism in Medicine at any major bookseller or their local bookstores. And I actually have a special campaign with Cafe Con Libros, which is a Black woman-owned bookstore in Brooklyn, New York. You can order from there and get a signed copy by yours truly. And you can find me on any social media channel. <laughs> Amazing. Anyways, my love, thank you so much. This is so great. (laughs) It was so much fun talking to you. Thanks for listening to The Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.